Hello, my name's Samuel Keith Harris. I just wanted to mention that my books are out now on Amazon. So if you search Samuel Keith Harris, you'll find my first three books there. Thanks for watching. Hello, my name is Samuel Keith Harris, and welcome back to another episode of Morning Devotionals. Let's start our day with Jesus. Father, I thank you that we can come into your presence and worship you and lift up your holy name. God, be glorified as we seek you here today. We want to learn of you, Lord, and be changed by you into the very image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in your precious holy name that we pray, King Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 5. We'll be taking our text from the book of James chapter 5, and we'll start at verse 1. The scripture says in James 5, 1, Look here, you rich people, weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Let me point out that this letter is written to Christians. The book of James is written to a group of Christians and you go through the whole book you will not see one time where in this book it gives an encouragement to rich people it, it, it's actually warnings to rich people and he says and you poor god chose you to be rich in faith and so it's very interesting because our mindset is completely backwards in a lot of churches that we actually esteem the rich but god doesn't right because many people are arrogant because of their riches the scripture says that they see their riches as a high wall that brings them safety when god is the one who's supposed to bring you safety god is not a fan of you trusting in your finances god is god wants christians to trust in him to meet all their needs according to his riches and glory by christ jesus he wants to meet your needs but he he does not want you to trust in the, the job you have or that no he wants to be your source you need to see god as your source and i love how james gives warnings to the rich he says look here you rich people weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth eaten rags so people have fine clothes they have many fine clothes many fine pairs of shoes many and and the scripture says beware you people uh, your moth-eaten rags that you you esteem as 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 nice clothing they're going to be eaten by moths look what it says it says your wealth is rotting away your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags your gold and silver are corroded the very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire and many times i people i think people just read past that passage too quickly that's actually telling us of the coming judgment for people who heap up riches and wealth and clothes and fine things for themselves. And I got to tell you personally, I believe this is also a reference to a lot of people that claim Christ also. Like this mindset that we need to heap up all this stuff or like God, of course God would want me to heap up all this stuff. No, he frees you from the desire to want to heap up all this stuff. Yes, I understand if you have a nice house. I understand if you have a nice car. Obviously, we need things that run well and that work well. But it's this mindset that I have to have an abundance of nice things that can suck the life of God out of us. And you can even do ministry wrongly uh, and, and get all this material stuff for yourself. That This is not the kingdom of God. Our focus is not on material things. Our focus is on Jesus and making him known and not making him known by our material things because sinners have material things, making him known by the character of Christ that God forms within us as we humble ourselves before his mighty hand. Now look at this. It says, it'll actually eat away your flesh like fire. And remember, this was written to Christians with lots of money. It says, this corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. So the, the, uh, the excess amount of money in your bank account will actually preach against you on the day of judgment. Your excess things that are rotting away, cars you don't even drive, um, um, clothes you're not even wearing will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of Heaven's armies. People who work hard but don't have any money and they're crying out because they have to work and they still don't have enough money to pay their bills. Their cries are reaching the, the ears of the Lord. 
How would you like to be a business owner and cheating people of their wages on the day of judgment? That would not be a pleasing, a pleasing day for you. It says, you have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. Every desire I have, I must have it satisfied, you know, because the Lord wants me blessed and the Lord wants me to have what I want. And it's like, okay, let, let's hold on. I, I do believe that the scriptures tell us that God gives us richly all things to enjoy. But I do not believe in this mindset of we always have to live in luxury and we always have to be first and that we should satisfy our every desire. It says you have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. So you're, you're, you're fattening yourself for the, the day of slaughter. All these things you're buying are going to testify against you. The scripture says, though you have things, act as if you have no things. It even says, if you're married, act as though you're not married. It's not saying to run out on your wife or anything or your husband or anything like that. It's just telling us that though we use the things of this world, our main job every day is to pursue Jesus Christ as if we were single. Um, obviously, you have a good marriage. Obviously, you have to use the things of this world, but you're using them and and you don't have this mindset, I possess this, I'm just using this. That That's kind of our mindset in the Christian faith. It says, you have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. Isn't that heartbreaking? God, God is not for people heaping up riches and not helping other people. God is for you helping those who need help with the riches he has entrusted to you he's entrusted those to you your finances he's entrusted them to you and he wants you to do good with them all right so let's look at this verse 7 dear brothers and sisters be patient as you wait for the lord's return so jesus christ is returning he'll be he'll be coming soon um and so the scripture tells us to be patient for the coming of the lord and we need to be watchful in prayer we need to keep our garments unspotted our lives unspotted from the filth and defilements of the world and sin and be patient for the lord jesus's return it says consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring they eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen you too must be patient take courage for the coming of the lord is near so Jesus Christ is coming soon. The coming of the Lord is soon. And so we're looking eagerly for Jesus to split the sky. What's he going to do when he comes back? One, he's going to destroy all sin and wicked people, the scriptures tell us. And two, he's going to bring salvation to those who are trusting in him. We'll be caught up together. Christians will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But he is coming to also bring judgment on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the Lord Jesus. Second Thessalonians chapter one tells us. So for those who are doing good and living in Christ and living for the kingdom of God, you have you, you should have eager anticipation as you're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus. For you who are not obeying God, you, fear and wrath should be in your meditation of what's coming upon you so that you'll realize you need to repent and get in Christ. You need to turn your back on sin and turn to Christ before it's too late. It says, you too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. Now this is a very convicting verse. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. What does it mean to grumble about another brother or sister? Oh, I just don't like them. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not fond of them. And I got to tell you the truth. Sometimes in my heart, I've been there. Okay, but you got to kill that. Scripture says, don't grumble at each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. We will be judged for our grumbling against our brother or sister. It's actually hurtful to the body of Christ. It actually hurts the unity that the Holy Spirit's trying to bring to us when we say, eh, I don't like them because they're not my preference, when the Holy Spirit's like, I want you to be unified with them. Be unified over the fact that you both love Jesus, that you know Jesus, and that you're waiting for the coming of the Lord also. It says, for look, the judge is standing at the door. Jesus is standing at the door. He's watching. He knows everything. He hears your conversation. And so I just pray that we'd be purified in our love for our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and that we wouldn't we wouldn't have preference, but that we would love all 
of our brothers and sisters in Jesus because they know him and because God has received them. He's, he's caused them to be born again to a living hope also. And may we have unity of the faith. May we be of the same mind, the same purpose, to love Jesus, to make him known, and to have good Christian fellowship with each other and call on the Lord out of a pure heart and a pure motive. So let's look at this. For examples of patience in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure suffering. And we should. We should give great honor to people who have endured suffering and remain faithful to Jesus. Not just endure suffering, but you remain faithful to Jesus amidst your suffering. It says, uh, for instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. The Lord... The Lord uh, gave to Job double what was taken away from him. He endured that long period of suffering and God repaid him with blessing because of his endurance. And so may we have the endurance Job had. It says, you can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. And that's key to realize that the Lord is tender and he's merciful and he loves us and he wants to reward us, but we must remain faithful under trial. We must Remain faithful to him when tempted and not give in, but surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and in his keeping power to keep us away from sin and in his grace. It says, but most of all, brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. Let's not promise all these extravagant promises to people and then not follow through. Let's just say a simple yes, I will or a no, I won't. Or else you will you will sin and be condemned if you make oaths and you don't follow up on them. No, your word means a lot. So let's not sin and be condemned by making oaths. But let's just say a simple, yes, I'll do that. If somebody asks us to do something, yeah, I'll do that. Or no, I won't do that. All right. So going on to verse 13. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. And my question for you is, are you suffering a hardship? Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. We should pray if we're suffering hardship. Be intimate with the Lord. Get in the presence of God. Uh, open up our heart to him. Offer up our prayer, our supplications, our, our, e our eager pleadings before God. And ask him to refine us and, and, and perfect us amidst uh, a suffering that we may be going through. Form himself in us, the very character of Jesus Christ. Patient endurance amidst all of it. If you're suffering hardships, you should pray, and the Comforter will comfort you in that place. The Holy Spirit will bring comfort to you, and life to you, and encouragement to you to seek God and, and find your comfort all in satisfaction in Him amidst rough, harsh circumstances that life throws at you. And it's there to choke the life of God out of you, so let's not let that happen. It says, are any of you happy? You should sing praises, so let's sing to God. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Right? So when people are sick, they should call for the elders of the church, those who are leaders in the church, to come and pray for them, to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And this is what it says. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. So there's physical healing that God wants to bring to to, to the people in the body of Christ. So call the elders of the church, have them pray for you, and the scripture says that the prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. So if, if the sick aren't healed, then maybe the prayer wasn't offered in faith. And so sometimes when I've seen somebody not healed, I'll, I'll take the blame. But I do want to press in and see many more people healed. And I have seen people healed physically. It says such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. So it's the Lord who makes them well. And the prayer offered in faith accesses that power for the Lord to make them well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So there's also forgiveness of sins. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. It's important that we confess our sins if we want physical healing. It says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person. So let's hold on before we go on. Let's not just ask for the Lord to forgive us or to heal us if, if we're not willing to confess our short, our shortcomings and, and what we've done wrong and our sins that we've done in his sight. Now let's be willing to confess our sins and then ask God for the benefit of his healing power. It says, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person 
has great power and produces wonderful results. So a righteous person who prays can actually, and it's earnest, it's heartfelt, it, produce, it has power and it produces great results. Healing for your body, deliverance. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you're struggling with bondages, the power of God can be accessed when a righteous man prays for you and the power of that bro will break in your life and, and the sickness on your body will break in your life when a righteous man prays in faith and it's heartfelt. It says, Elijah was as human as we are and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. So it compares us to Elijah and says he's human just like we are. When he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, guess what? None fell for three and a half years. He shut up the heavens by his prayer. It says, then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. So that's the power that's available according to James chapter 5. Verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. So let's end on these verses. It says, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back. So that tells us that you can be walking in freedom from sin, walking in the Lord and turn away from the Lord because it says that you can wander from the truth but also that you can be brought back if you have wandered from the truth. It says you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back, the person who strayed, the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. The Lord wants to forgive you. The Lord wants to cleanse you and make you new. But you gotta be willing if you've walked off the path to admit that you sinned against God and that you need to come back onto the path and God will receive you, he'll wash you, he'll make you new, he'll give you desires to pursue him and to love him once again, and you'll delight in the word like you did. You'll, you'll enjoy prayer like you did, and, and you, you'll walk in freedom from sin and delight in God. And so I pray that that would be all of our experiences, that none of us would continue in sin, but that we would walk in the purity of the Holy Spirit, enjoying our God. So Father, I thank you that we could come into your presence and hear your word. Thank you that your word transforms us, it renews us, it purifies us, God. Form Christ in us. Lord, get glory out of our lives. May the fruits of the Spirit be formed in us. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and everybody said, Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Morning Devotionals, and I'll see you next time.